Okay, so we were busy talking about um, flatworms at the last lecture. And remember, the flatworms are what we call acelomites um, due to not having a body cavity. All the tissues come together. Um, there's free living flatworms, and some flatworms, or majority of flatworms, are actually parasitic. So now we're going to start moving into pseudocelomates, and those will include um, rotifers and roundworms, which are nematodes. They're some of the most common, most prevalent animals on Earth, but a lot of them are microscopic. But some are very large, and some are parasitic and free living. So we'll get into those. But those are pseudocelomates. Remember. A pseudocelomate means that they have a bit of a body cavity, but it's not fully enclosed. And then we'll get into coelomates, animals with a, a true body cavity that has um, a covering around it that makes it connected. Um, remember that these animals over here are protosomes, and that has to do with their embryology. So when there's an embryo, and if you don't know what I'm talking about, go back and check the previous lecture. But when they get that ball of cells called a blastocyl, um, a hole forms in it, and that hole becomes the mouth and protosomes, or the anus and deuterosomes. That would include us. So we've been going up to this um, tree also of life. And so we've gotten to body cavities. Without body cavities? <laughs> without body cavities, acelomates, and with body cavities. That's what the rest of these animals are here. So we're gonna start talking about them. Uh, we're gonna break it up a little bit with a group of animals that we've already talked about a little bit, known as um, lophotrochozoans, which included the flatworms and lophophores, which we will get into in a moment. And, um, and so they branch off. And so we have a group of animals called lophophores, which are animals that have this kind of U-shaped body plan that you'll, it'll make more sense when we look at the digestive system. So it'll make a little more sense when we get into their body plan images. Um, I think we talked about rotifers last time too. Let me double check that. No, actually we're gonna talk about rotifers today in a moment. So anyway, we have these lophotrochozoans. Remember they have a triple blastic, meaning they have three embryonic cell layers, an outer layer called an ectoderm, an inner layer called an endoderm and a mesoderm. And then we have, uh, so we're gonna start talking about these lophophores, but again, what we've talked about at the last lecture where we finished up was platy helmets. And remember, those are the flatworms. So we're gonna start talking about rotifers and the rest of these animals underneath. This realized after we get through lophophores, which are these animals here, the bryozoa, brachiopod, and fornidia, We'll begin talking about animals with a spiral cleavage and an active locomotion, which includes annelids, which are worms, mollusks, which include octopi and stuff like that, and another group of worms called nematuria. So again, um, the body cavity, we talked a little bit about the evolution of body cavities and why they're important. Part of it is their rapid passage of materials, that's their circulation. They also allow for muscles to, to drive the body movement. And then they have more organ functions that are not deformed by surrounding muscles. So there's some advantages evolutionarily to having a body cavity. So we talked about the different body plans a little bit, but just to kind of reiter re to reiterate it, we have acelomates, which have no body cavity like these flatworms. And so the tissues are literally just laying on top of each other. 
And then we have the pseudocelomates, which have a body cavity, but they're just not completely enclosed. So like this body cavity is still kind of, while it's still there, it's not really a true covering like we see in this earthworm here. So this would be a nematode, which is a different type of worm. And then this was an actually, you could argue a more evolutionarily advanced worm called an earthworm, a coelomate. So we're gonna talk about them as well. You're gonna find that a lot of the animals are actually very worm-like on earth. So when we look at pseudocelomates, there are seven, seven different phylum. So that means a lot more animals are coelomates. So there's not that many phyla that are pseudocelomates. They, the pseudocele serves as a high, hydrostatic skeleton. That means they can fill it up with water and help it to move around and not use the muscles against the skeleton themselves. So they're literally filling up a tube, kind of like a balloon, they're filling up one side and then you push it and the balloon moves forward. That's how it works to help move its body. They lack a defined circulatory system, so they don't have um, veins and arteries and things like that. And there's a couple important phyla, and those are that include the nematodes, which are extremely prevalent. Some are free living, some are parasitic parasites. And we'll kind of hit on a little bit of both of those. And then there's also rotifers, which are found in freshwater streams attached to rocks, and then they can filter feed. You can kind of see the cilia on their kind of their mouth area and they will filter feed and bring water in and then they can chew it up with a kind of a hardened mastica area. <coughs> and so here is another image of a rotifer. You can see that it has kind of a foot toes and an anus that holds it to its substrate. And then the cilia can help beat water in and bring food into their mouth region. <clears throat> and then this mastax can grind the food and then it'll be digested in their um, digestive system, kind of like a stomach and intestines, and then, um, and then out their anus. They do have gonads um, for male and female parts. They can, um, most, there's about 1800 known species that live in fresh water. Again, there's males and females. Um, and so they can produce diploid eggs. That means they have double the chromosomes, one set of chromosomes from the mother, another from the father. The ciliated organ around their mouth is called a cornea. And that's what's feeding the particles towards their mouth. And again, the phylum is actually known as rotifera. It is comprised of bilateral, bilaterally symmetrical pseudocelomate unsegmented animals that have those three cell layers, the ectoderm, the mesoderm, and endoderm. Most rotifers are very tiny, but they have highly developed internal organs. The rotifers have a complete gut passing from the anterior part of their mouth to the posterior anus. Their pseudocelum functions as a hydrostatic skeleton, and so they can move, and they can also move by rapidly beating their cilia now let's move to the next phylum, nematodes. Nematodes are bilaterally symmetrical, cylindrical, and unsegmented worms. They have a thick, flexible cuticle, and their mouth is equipped with a piercing organ called stylets. The food passes through the mouth by the sucking action of the pharynx. They lack flagella or cilia, and their reproduction is also sexual. So here's our um, nematode and you can slice through it and so you see a cross section you can see the muscles the intestines here you can see the oviduct the uterus the ovaries the nerve cord and uh, muscles located around it and you can see it has, a, has a very thick cuticle and you don't really see the segments and again though this um, animal is present in all sorts of different types of environments and often can be microscopic in size to relatively large sizes. 
<clears throat> Hundreds or of thousands may live in handfuls of fertile soil. And adult nematodes consist of very few cells. One of the most famous ones is known as C. elegans. And it's basically one of the most studied animals. And it has 900, exactly 959 cells. And it's the only animal whose complete cellular anatomy is known. So this is why it's so, it's, it's extremely well studied, but it's, and it's actually a very good system for studying unique aspects of animals and their development because they're manageable. So sometimes studying simple animals helps us to understand more complex animals. Um, the pseudocil of a nematode separates the endoderm line cut with the rest of the body and the digestive tract is one way. Food enters into the mouth, travels through the digestive system and then exits the anus. Nematodes have excretory ducts that permit them to conserve water and live on land. Other roundworms also have excretory cells that are called flame cells. So these are kind of like primitive kidneys um, for the animal. Again, the, the body is covered in a thick cuticle and the muscles extend along the body. So again, I'm not sure how it's pronounced it off the top of your head, but C. elegans is the way that most people refer to it. It's the only known animal that's completely known cellular anatomy. That's really remarkable. However, many of these in the phylum are actually parasitic. Another well-known one is trichinella, which causes trichinosis. And this is actually acquired from pigs and other animals, even polar bears and bears, if you eat them raw you can get a disease called trichinosis, which will, can kill you, can make your muscles extremely painful, cause um, problems with your breathing, and a lot of it's because it'll live inside your tissues as cysts. I'll show you a picture of that in a moment. There's also some very large ones like Ascocarius lambricotes, which is an intestinal roundworm found in um, a variety of animals. It can also infect people. One out of every six people worldwide are actually infected by this intestinal roundworm. Granted, we don't see it in developed nations as much as we see it in developing nations. So roundworms, again, have this thick multilayered cuticle that gives their body a shape. A roundworm sheds its cuticle four times as it grows. There's 25,000 species of roundworm that has been described that the actual number of living species may be well over a million. Brown worms exchange oxygen and nutrients with the environment through their cuticle and intestines. They can take the oxygen directly in through their body. Rhythmic contractions of the pharynx uh, of, of the worms anterior moves materials through their gut. So you can actually see it traveling through their gut. Now here's an example with the worm living in muscle tissue and it can cause the diseases like trichinosis. One of the most, excuse me, let's go back to this. One of the most abundant universally distributed animals throughout the world. So it's been said that you could actually vaporize everything in the world but these nematodes and you would still see shadings of mountains and trees and grass because they're so prevalent either on them, in them or are parasitic. And again, there are, a lot of them are microscopic in size. They are predatory and parasitic, as I mentioned before. Um, here's where trichinosis can actually live in your muscles. And again, it'll cause severe muscle pain, could kill you, breathing problems and stuff like that. What happens is um, trichinosis gets into the muscles of animals and then a, and an animal will eat like a raw pork or a raw pig or a raw um, bear or whatever, and ingest that animal, the worms will break out of the muscles and then they can actually reproduce in your system, in your digestive system, and or they can um, um, travel into your muscles and form these cysts. So again, it causes severe problems. 
I'll maybe I'll show you a video on that um, in your homework. Okay, so now we've um, talked about these groups here. Let's start talking about lophorates. And so these members of these phylum are primarily marine. Lophorates are animals that obtain their food by filtering it from ocean waters. And I think they tend to be pretty small. These animals have a unique feature, the lophophore, a circular or U-shaped ridge around the mouth that bears two rows of ciliated hollow tentacles. The lophophore is used for both uh, food collection and gas exchange. Nearly all lophorates are sessile, so that means they don't move. And so they'll be sitting on the ocean floor and they'll be, and the lophophore tentacles will be um, flopping around. And food will come in and then go through this U shaped digestive system and then out the anus. So that's what makes them lophophores. And um, again, there's, I think there's only a few phylum of them but they all have this U-shaped body shape that they call lophophore. Um, another group is the fornids. There's 20 known species of fornids. And again, this is a type of lophophore that are sanitary that live in the mud or sandy sediment. So this is actually a picture of them going back and forth. You can see it actually comes out flops around, spins around, collecting food or whatever, and then they can go back into the soil and come back out. Again, this is found in a marine habitat, so being on ocean floors. And so, again, they range in size from five to 25 centimeters, so not very big. They can also secrete um, tubes to live in, the like chitinous tubes that helps to provide the protection. So they can have a little chitinous tube that helps provide protection. Ectoprocs are colonial lophorates that live in houses secreted by their body walls. So their bodies can actually form the secretion that, again, that's chitinous that provides a little bit of protection from them. Ectoprocs are a greater control over the lophophore than members of lophophyte phyla. Colonies of ectoprocs are formed by asexual reproduction, so they can actually reproduce like clones. They can have as many, many as two million members, so they're huge numbers of individuals. Ectoprocs are produced, can also reproduce uh, sexually. Fertilization is internal, developing embryos that are brooded before they exit as larvae. So again, it's just a lot of weird animals. They, we don't encounter much in our lives of ever. So here is ectoprox. And you can see their little chitinous tube here and it's sticking out and go in and out of this tube. And then they just spend time filter feeding and bringing food through their lophophor, which is that U-shaped structure. Brachiopods are also another type of lophorate because it has a U-shaped body structure. You might not see it very easily in this picture, but it basically brings food in, travels through the U-shaped structure and comes back out of a hole. It looks like a mollusk. It looks like a clam or something like that, but it is not a clam. It's a lophorite and it has a different body structure, but it has a lot of that mollusk appearance. Brachiopods tend to, again, they're found on the oceans. They are attached to substrate, um, bedded in soft sediment, and most of the species will fertilize externally in the water. Uh, so the sperm and eggs will leave the body and actually be fertilized in the water. Apparently, they've been around for a long, long time. There's more than 26,000 fossil species that have been described. So that's kind of cool in a way and crazy in the other way to think about that there are people that are extreme experts of this that have been able as groups of people me, to identify 26,000 species. Here's another, um, now here, so now we're gonna get into the cleavage 
worm like plant. If you go back to this picture here, so now we're going to start talking about spiralins. So we're moving down this chart. So the spiralin lineage gave rise to this mini phyla with members of more than a dozen of these phyla being worm like. And again, we just keep seeing worm like after worm like after worm like animals. Um, they're not true worms, but they're very worm like. They lack legs, they're soft bodied, um, that enables them to move through muddy or sandy marine environments. And in this case, this animal actually sends, has a proboscis that can protrude, help collect food out of the water, water and actually suck it back into its body to be absorbed. And those are known as ribbon worms. So this is a type of ribbon worm right here. So ribbon worms have this long inverted proboscis that they can flop around and pick up food and then bring it into its mouth and then into its intestines. So within the body of ribbon worms is a fluid-like cavity called the rhynchoseal, rhynchoseal, within which the hollow, which is hollow, and then there's a muscular proboscis. That's what this is right here. When the muscles surround the rhynchoseal contract, the proboscis is diverted explosively through the anterior end. The proboscis is armed with sharp stylets that pierce the prey and through which the paralysis inducing toxins are discharged. So I guess it can eat little things apparently that are toxic with a little bit of a, so it's basically a carnivore. So I kind of said something about filter feeding, but apparently it's more of a carnivore-ish worm. Again, these are animals that I'm not sure I've ever seen in real life. I've only maybe watched a video on. So just, so it's good. So what I really want you to get out of this is just that there's a lot of different animals out there that you wouldn't ever even thought of that exist doing their thing well before humans have shown up. So I want you to get that out of this zoology class. And there are people that are experts on these. So anyway, that finishes up this short lecture on the next group. Uh, so we talked about spiralins, lophophorates. We talked a little bit about the different body plans. And so it will start to start in the next couple of lectures, we'll start to see animals. There'll still be some worm-like animals that we got to get through and understand a little bit about. And then we'll start moving into animals that we're very familiar with. Excuse me. It's about 10.30 when I give this lecture. So anyway, I will post this lecture. I would just like a half page for this particular lecture since it was short. Um, single space is preferable. Explaining a little bit about what you learned about these different animals. I will probably provide a little homework assignment eventually with some videos to give you another perspective on these different animals. Again, short videos is my preference. Anyway, that finishes up this lecture. Take care.